Good morning or good afternoon, whenever you're joining me. If you're live, it's 1030 on September 6th. Thanks for being with me. We're going to spend a few moments in the study of Scripture today. So as you're logging on and getting your Bible out, we're in Romans chapter 13. And we're going to be just three verses today. And you say, oh, we'll be done fast. Well, don't count on it. It may take us a few minutes, but that'll be worth your time. Romans chapter 13, beginning with verse number 8, is where we're going to start. So if you want to go ahead and get your Bibles out and get ready, that's where we're going to be. Okay, so remember where we are in the book of Romans. Starting in chapter 12, we have this great big therefore. And whenever you see a therefore, treat therefore like a bridge. It's connecting two shores. So he, Paul basically in 1 through 8, let's call it, he uh, uh, really details the, the mercies of God and the lengths to which God has gone to redeem us and uh, to secure our salvation. In chapter 12, now 10, 9, 10, and 11, he deals with the, 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 the salvation of God and he talks about Jews and Gentiles and, and it's a really it's an in-depth section, uh, complicated in, in, in areas, talks about election and so forth. So some difficulties there in, that, in terms of uh, our patience to understand it, but really profoundly beautiful when it comes to seeing God's salvation for Jew and Gentile alike. But chapter 12 then begins this great big, therefore, in light of the mercies of God that Paul has spent several chapters detailing, this then is how we will live. All right, so chapter 12 dealt with a lot of different um, uh, moral exhortations. And chapter 13 is going to now speak of another area of life that, that needs to be addressed for how the Christian should live. The first seven verses of chapter 13, I, I, the message was on in the service this morning. So if you didn't get a chance to watch that, uh, you want to watch the sermon, or watch the whole service. It's available on the Facebook page. The sermon will be uploaded on Tuesday, so you can watch just the sermon if you prefer. But that will be available Tuesday. So if you want to hear just the first seven verses on the Christian and governing authorities or the government, uh, that's what the message was on, and you can watch that uh, whenever it works for you. We're beginning in verse number 8. Okay, so Paul says this, um, Owe no one anything except to love each other, for the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. For the commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet, and any other commandment are summed up in this word, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbor, therefore love is the fulfilling of the law. All right. So just that brief section, and clearly Paul's main emphasis here is on love. And we need to spend a few minutes talking about this, because I don't think it's any uh, uh, revel revelation to you that, that the way people define love is all over the map, right? Like, for, for example, just, just culturally speaking, we would understand as an American culture, typically it would be something of this nature. Love is, like I hear these phrases, love is love, which basically means love whoever you want, however you want, because love is love and there are no boundaries to it and no, no limits to it. Just love whoever you want to love and however you want to love them. Kind of just wide open sort of thing. Love affirms, love accepts, love celebrates, love doesn't exclude or limit. Love is this really amorphous, so lacking form, uh, thing that you can basically, it's like Play-Doh. You basically shape it however you want it, and it's yours to do with as you please. That's kind of the idea behind love in our culture. And, and people, that's why that whole love is love phrase is basically, hey, this is my Play-Doh. I can shape it however I want to. Who are you to tell me that I can't make Plato like this? That's kind of the idea. Now, Scripture doesn't see love that way. Now, I know you'll have preachers talk like that. I'm not here to argue with them. All I'm going to tell you to do is read the context. When they cite verses, 
don't ever let them give you one verse or just a couple. You, you need to read it in context. See what's, what's happening on the larger whole, all right? And I think you'll find that uh, Scripture has a markedly different understanding of what love is than what popular culture does. Uh, and further, um, it should be a little bit of a red flag to you, or a little bit of an alarm bells going off. If the scripture just always seems to agree with whatever the popular culture says, if that's kind of the message, mm, maybe something inside of you would say, hmm, that would be awfully odd if God's word just simply always agreed with whatever the popular, popular opinion in the culture was. So anyway, here's the basic message I want to point out to you, and, and then we'll work through this. Love must be rightly ordered. Love must be rightly ordered. Why? Why must our love be rightly ordered? All right. Well, basically it's this, because our passions are bent. Jesus says in Matthew 15, For out of the heart come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false witness, slander. These are what defile a person. That's what comes out of the human heart. Our passions, our desires are bent. So we can't start with our desires. We can't start with our passions. That cannot be our plumb line. You know, a plumb line, right? The, the carpenter takes that chalk string, stretches it out, snaps it. The plumb line is the standard against which everything else is measured. It's the straight line against which crooked is defined. You cannot begin with your passions and desires as your plumb line because they're bent, they're crooked. All right, so we can't start there, but that's precisely where culture starts is with desires and it establishes desires as the plumb line, and then it finds God's word to be out of line with it, and then either has to be rejected or changed. So that's a concern. Okay, so um, in Matthew chapter 22, this provides some of the background to the text that we just read from Romans. So I'm going to read the Matthew text where Jesus is speaking, talking about love, and then Paul, who bases what he says pretty much on what Jesus says, all right? Uh, chapter 22 in Matthew's Gospel. You can turn there if you want to, otherwise just listen. I'm at Matthew 22, 34. That's where I'm going to start reading. But when the Pharisees heard that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together. And one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question to test him. Now, by the way, I just love this whole setup because <laughs> they hear that Jesus silenced the Sadducees, and they have no love for the Sadducees, the Pharisees don't. And they're thinking, hey, they couldn't outwit Jesus. I bet we can. Yeah, I want to say, how do you think that's going to go? But anyway, uh, verse 36, here's their question. Teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? So what's the greatest commandment? This was a huge debate. People always want to argue about what's the greatest commandment. And Jesus said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. All right? These two commandments Everything is built on this, these love commandments. <clears throat> so um, what Jesus is basically, is basically saying is that these two commandments summarize the moral law of God. If you had to whittle it down to the, its essence, what would be the way to express what the summary of the moral law of God is? Love God, love neighbor. That's what Jesus basically says. Okay, so... The law is summarized by the word love. That's an important point to understand what Jesus is saying. The law is summarized by the word love. So love 
has a certain definition, certain, a certain boundary point, a certain plumb line, certain scaffolding that define it and limit it and guide it and, and tell us what it is. All right? So the law is summarized by the word love. And Paul, in our Romans text, explicitly defines Jesus' command to love with the Ten Commandments. So here's what he writes again, right? He says, these are the commandments. You shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet. And any other commandment are summed up in this word, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. So, Paul's talking about neighbor love. He's not saying that the first commandment about loving God is not important, but he's talking about neighbor love in this context, okay? So he's saying, uh, behind Jesus' exhortation to love are the Ten Commandments, okay? The Ten Commandments define the word love. Now, it's true that Paul will say in Galatians that we do not live under the law of Moses. So the law, or the covenant made on Mount Sinai, Paul will say in Galatians, it was a tutor, a guardian, to lead us to Christ and then to step aside. But it would be a total misunderstanding of Paul from Galatians to say that the law of Moses has nothing to say about ethics in the New Testament, because it most certainly does. And Jesus makes this clear, and Paul makes this clear. So think of the word love like a, a hyperlink. So if you've ever been on a website before, and you see the blue word, and if you click on it, it opens a new web page, right? a new, a new uh, page with more information. So think of the word love like a hyperlink. And you click on it, and it opens the Ten Commandments. Okay? That's how you define the word love. It's how we love God and how we love neighbor. I want you to notice, though, and this is very countercultural. cultural um, this, this may rub you the wrong way. It will rub a lot of people the wrong way. Scripture doesn't leave this up to us. It doesn't. Remember, our hearts are bent. Our passions are disordered. They cannot be allowed to define love. So, the commandments, the Ten Commandments, define love for us. So, for example, love God. Know, here's how you love God, all right? So, if you want to look at the first table of the law, the first three commandments, how do you love God? Have no other gods. Honor the name. Honor the day. So, no other gods. Honor the name. Honor the day. That's how we love God. How do you love your neighbor? Honor the family father, mother, child, honor life from the womb to the tomb, honor marriage and sex, male and female, united and exclusive, lifelong, one flesh union aimed toward procreation, honor property, honor reputation, and keep your heart pure in relation to your neighbor. That, that's a summary of the Ten Commandments. So actually there was a, a, a writer, his name's Wesley Hill, he was writing in, in a, a journal called First Things, he talks about this, and I think his, his, his insights are really helpful, and I want to share with you this little paragraph I'm going to read. In a fallen world, talk about love can mask a kind of relativism. So relativism, by the way, is when um, truth is relative and not objective. So it's, it's relative to the situation, to the person, and it's changeable. So truth is Plato, and each person gets to mold it. That's the idea. And he's saying, in a fallen world, that love is sub subject to be treated like that as well, like it's Plato, and you can mold it however you want to. Okay, so this is why, he continues, the catechetical tradition of the Christian churches has been united in its use of the Ten Commandments precisely because it has recognized that we Christians so often fail to discern what real love amounts to. And we need the Old Testament's commandments to shine a spotlight on our slippery self-justifications. We may intend to treat a sexual partner as God in Christ has treated us. We may try to act toward them out of self-giving love, but the distorting effects of sin mean that we must be told what love looks like in action if we're not to get it wrong. This is really important. Scripture tells us what 
love looks like. It does not let us define that. And we can get worked up about that if we want to, but then we need to go back and really check our motives and check our desires. And we're gonna find that, that those desires are bent and we need to take Jesus' words very seriously about what comes out of our heart. We simply can't start with the heart. We have to begin with the word. So uh, the formula of Concord, which is a document in the Lutheran Book of Confessions, written, by the way, in 1580, the formula of Concord. And so that document within the larger book. So back here, this is the Book of Concord. Within this book, I know it's a thick one, within this book is the formula of Concord. It talks about this. I want to read what it says. Believers require the teaching of the law so that they do not fall back on their own holiness and piety and under the appearance of God's spirit establish their own service to God on the basis of their own choice without God's word or command. As it is written in Deuteronomy 12, you shall not act all according to your own desires but listen to the commands and laws which I command you, and you shall not add to them nor take anything from them. Okay, again, do you hear what the Word of God is saying? You cannot begin with your desires. You cannot begin with your passions. You must begin with what God has told us. And remember, God's not mean. He loves us. He loves us. So what he tells us is ultimately for our good. He knows how to rightly order our loves and what will actually result in human flourishing and what will result in basically suffering and misery. And he doesn't want us to go down the road of suffering and misery. So he calls us to hear his word and to align our loves, our passions, our desires with his word and then to trust him that by acting in line with what he calls good, we will discover the flourishing and the joy that he offers. That may mean, though, that there are certain desires that we have to die to. Is that easy? No, it's not easy for any of us because all of us have our favorite sinful desires, every last one of us. And but the thing is, we don't make exceptions and say, well, everybody gets one or two. No, these are the things that drive wedges between us and the Lord. We are to die to them and live the new life in Christ. But our point for now is, like, like the formula of Concord was just saying, right? That, that, that we don't establish um, basically our own choice as the standard without God's word or command. All right, so it does not begin with our choice. And I know in America... We have this, this, we're enamored with our right to choose everything. It doesn't work that way when we come to God. He, well, he's the chooser, we're always the chosen. But when it comes down to his word, he speaks first. And we seek to align our, our desires and passions with his word. So we don't define love. Why? Because our natures are corrupt and we will bend our definition to fit our desires every time. We must let scripture define love for us and it does that with the Ten Commandments. So we love God by worshiping the one and only true God, honoring his name and keeping the Sabbath to hear his word. We love the neighbor by honoring family, father, mother, child and family supporting institutions. We honor life from the womb to the tomb, we honor marriage and sex, one man and one woman, in this exclusive, lifelong, one flesh union aimed toward procreation. We honor property, we honor reputation, and we keep our hearts pure in relation to our neighbor. That is love. That's how we put love into action. Yes, there's an emotional component to love. I'm not overlooking that, but I'm speaking about the action component of love. The, the doing, because it's way too easy to say to someone, you know, do, do you love your child? Do you love your neighbor? Do you love your spouse? Of course. That's not really the question that scripture is asking us. It's asking, 
do you understand what's required of you to love this person? So love is very much action-oriented, and to love like Christ requires the death of self every day out of reverence for Christ. Paul talks about that in Ephesians chapter 5. Okay, so again, we must be told what love is. Our natures are not trustworthy enough to define love on our own. We will tend toward relativism and the unquestioning affirmation of our desires. And that's not love. So, Paul's words one more time. You shall not commit adultery. He says the commandments. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not murder. You shall not steal. You shall not covet. And any other commandments are summed up in the word, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love is defined by the Ten Commandments. Okay, threw a lot at you. Really important stuff. I invite you, as always, to offer comments, email, message, however you want to visit about this. Thanks for taking a little over 20 minutes of your time to, to be in reflection on this. This is a really important topic. If, if our world's confused about anything, it's what love is. Uh, and here scripture is going out of its way to help us understand how love is defined. It's defined by the Ten Commandments. Click on the hyperlink love, Ten Commandments will pop up. Then we spend our time reflecting on how we put that love into action for the well-being of our neighbor. And that's a, that's a conversation well worth having because, I mean, it, it's that self-denial, self-dying thing, loving like Christ's thing that actually will be a blessing to our neighbor and help us to reverence Christ in ways perhaps that will surprise us and actually bring us deeper joy. Okay, let's take a moment to close with prayer. Lord God, we thank you that you, because you love us and we see that love in action for us in the cross of Jesus. In fact, so many times, Lord, when you talk about love, you connect that love to the action of Jesus, like John 3, 16, right? For you so loved the world that in this way you gave your son. First John 3, 16, that this is how we know what love is. Jesus laid down his life for us. Um, in Romans chapter 5, right, where Paul talks about um, that, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us, that he put his love into action for us there, that you put your love into action and show us that love in action, but you also teach us what that love is. You define that for us, both in the person and work of Jesus Christ and demonstrating love in action, but also in the Ten Commandments, which show us what is required of us in how we love you and how we love our neighbor. We understand that, Lord, that hearing this will be very counterculture, very opposed to what the culture tells us, that, that we begin with our desires and our passions, and we establish that as the plumb line against which everything else must be judged. But that's upside down. That, that, that's backwards. It's just wrong. You teach us otherwise in your word. Help us not to start with our desires and passions, but to start with your word and your truth and to trust that because you love us, because we've seen that love in action in Jesus, that we can trust that when you teach us what love is and call us to live in line with it, even to die to ourselves so that we can live in line with it, that it is for our good and for your glory. So even if it means a death to our desires that we want, help us to do it that we may reverence Christ and you may receive glory and ultimately we may experience the blessing and the flourishing that you, that you offer through living in line with your word. Thank you for granting us this time in your word. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, thanks for taking time to be with me. Pastor Johnson's here tomorrow morning at 7.30, and I'll be back Tuesday at 7.30, so thanks a lot.